factors to uh, help to moderate these events. Um, I'd first like to remind everybody that this evening's presentation is being recorded. And the next thing I'd like to do is to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst in Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we meet virtually today. I'd also like to mention that the Food for Thought series is certified by McGill as a sustainable event, virtual in this case tonight. Tonight's lecture is the third of the 21st season of the Food for Thought lecture series. Our theme this year is Building Back Better, How to Sustainably Restructure Our Way of Living. Um, I'd ask you to keep your audio muted during the lecture unless you are asked to unmute yourself to ask questions verbally. That will happen once or twice during tonight's talk. And of course, at the end of the uh, lecture, there will be time for discussion and questions. And if you'd like to ask questions at any time, you can post them in the chat box or ask to, uh, for permission to unmute yourself and uh, direct your question toward the lecturer. So with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's lecturer. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Jen Gobby. Um, she has a doctoral degree from McGill University from the Department of uh, Natural Resource Sciences. She was participant in the Economics for the Anthropocene Partnership in that department at McGill. And she's now a postdoctoral fellow at Concordia University. She works closely with activists and organizers in environmental and climate justice movements in Canada. And her research is contributing to building a stronger, more transformative climate for change in our society. Um, going a little bit deeper into her past, she's founder of the Mud Girls Natural Building Collective, and she organizes with Climate Justice Montreal. And just in case she doesn't get around to it, I would like to put in a plug for her new book, which is called More Powerful Together, Conversations with Climate Activists and Land Defenders, and that's available from Fernwood Publishing. So with that, I would like to invite Jen to share her screen, and I'll turn the floor over to her. Hello, everyone. So yes, no, I was not going to miss the opportunity to <laughs> promote my book. There it is. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the book is the sort of final piece of the five-year project that I did at McGill uh, through the Economics for the Anthropocene Partnership. Uh, my supervisor, Peter Brown, is with us tonight. I saw him up there. Hey, Peter. And I think Dina's out there too. She's the, she runs the whole thing. So, um, so thanks to them for supporting my, this project that I'm talking about tonight. So, um, Thanks, Grant and Ingrid, for having me here. It's, it's an honor to be part of this. I remember going to several of the Food for Thought lectures during my PhD, and it's a great space to, to have good conversations. <laughs> so thanks for inviting me. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, the focus of my work is around understanding uh, social change, transformative change. How does that happen? How is that happening? How is that not happening? So that'll be the um, central theme of the talk. It's a great drinking game. Every time I say change or transformation, you can drink. I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Okay, so um, yeah, I will talk a bit about this. A lot of what I'm talking about is um, things I learned about it during the massive amount of reading I did during my PhD, but also through the, the, the many, many interviews and surveys I did um, with, with people involved in the movements that I'm part of. So, um, my research was conducted in, in collaboration with people in the climate justice and indigenous land defense movements across Canada. So a lot of what I'm saying comes from the knowledge gained through struggle, through on the ground activism and social change efforts. So I just wanted to make that clear. So I don't know if anyone saw this report in 2018 that came out at the IPC, IPCC that said, Preventing climate catastrophe will require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. So that is huge. 
and these are coming from climate scientists who are known not to be all make um, unfounded claims. So this is a huge claim coming from people who really know what they're talking about. And so that sets for us a huge, huge, huge project in front of us. And I think part of being able to create or build that kind of change is understanding <laughs> uh, transformative change in theory in practice, et cetera. So that's what my work is about, is try, how, how are we gonna do this? How are we doing this? It's not clear um, how we're gonna do those far reaching uh, changes in all our systems. So I'm gonna start with sharing a bunch of ways that change is being uh, affected in Canada right now. And then I'm gonna ask you which ones you think are the most effective or promising, okay? So yeah, again, change is happening, change needs to happen, how? So as we know, there's been uh, mounting over the last decade more and more protests and demonstrations for climate and other huge issues. Um, Montreal saw uh, the biggest march in, uh, biggest climate march in history with 500,000 people hitting the streets last year, just about a year ago. So there's a lot of that, a lot of people who put their faith that change happens by hitting the streets and massive numbers and showing, um, sort of demonstrating public will to try to influence decision makers. So that's, is that how change happens? A lot of people put their, um, their hope in efforts, educational efforts, that if we teach our children to value the climate, to value the earth, to value um, ecosystems, then they'll make better decisions long-term. And that's how we're gonna solve the climate crisis. So is climate education, is that, is that where you put your hope? Is that how you think uh, we're gonna drive this transformative change? Or is it through organizations? There's, there's many, many organizations across Canada and across the world who are specifically mandated to do uh, climate organizing. So, you know, this uh, Climate Action Network, there's 350.org, there is the LEAP, you know, the David Suzuki Foundation, all these groups are doing tons and tons of work around climate. Is that how change happens? A lot of people are putting their, their best efforts into uh, pushing for social change through courts, through the courts of law. By this here's a picture of a bunch of youth who have been suing the Canadian government for lack of action on climate change. Um, there are many examples of indigenous people taking uh, industry or government to court for um, forcing uh, fossil fuel infrastructure through their territories. That's been very, very powerful. Is that where we put our hope? Is that how transformative change is gonna happen? And then of course, um, Change can happen through actually creating, innovating, creating the technologies and the, the sort of uh, the systems by which we could live a, a, a climate friendly life um, and lifestyles. So innovating, living and promoting the solutions, whether those solutions are solar panels or agroecology or um, different forms of economic systems that are not driven by economic growth and capitalist um, incentives like so there's many different ways these solutions could look is that where we should put our energy you know like in developing and uh, promoting and living those solutions a lot of people put their their best uh thinking on how things where we should put our energy in policy so here is an example of uh initiatives in the last couple of years around the new green deal or the, sorry the green new deal <laughs> um and this was one that was uh led here in quebec and one of these, the, the picture of the guy on the second to the left is Damon Matthews, my current uh, supervisor. So he is part of this uh, group that launched uh, the Pact for a Green New Deal in Quebec. So this idea that if we could create a policy platform that decision makers could then take up that can lead the kind of change that's necessary to solve climate change or to address it, that's how we should do it. So do you put your hope in policy? Why are we not? Um, and then there's also a lot of people who put their hope in Indigenous land defense. So <clears throat> if you've been paying attention over the last couple of years, there's more and more instances of Indigenous people actively blocking the continuation of or, or the expansion of the fossil fuel industry in, in Canada. And the fossil, industry, fossil fuel industry has, of course, been contributing massively to the uh, Canadian uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So by stopping pipelines, by... Um, by blocking mines, there's this uh, real concrete 
contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So indigenous people in defending their lands, their waters, their territories, and their rights have been uh, a force for constraining the ongoing, exp ongoing expansion of the fossil fuel industry. Is that where we put our, our, our hopes and how do we then actively support that work as non-Indigenous people? So those are just some of the things and uh, there's a bunch more um, sort of strategies or approaches that people have been taking in Canada and elsewhere to try to make transformative change towards, uh, towards uh, a safe climate. Um, so I'd like to ask you now and feel free to, um, to raise your hand or to indicate or just to type in the chat. I'd like to hear what you folks think are some of the more, you don't have to pick one if that's hard to do, but just maybe reflect on what you think are some of the more promising ones and perhaps why you think that. So please feel free at this point to unmute yourself if you wanna make a comment to Jen. They tell me when I give lectures on Zoom, I have to count down from 30 to give people time to screw up their courage and ask a question. <laughs> I see some hands already. I see Catherine. Catherine. I can see you, go ahead if you like. Okay, so I think um, the innovation in living and promoting because we can't necessarily um, make the others work, but we can make ourselves work. Okay, so that's where people that, that can be done ourselves. Right. Yeah. And I, I do believe it needs to be both, obviously, but that's something we can do for like, definitely. So. Beatrice says in the chat, innovation and promoting solutions to give tools to politicians and decision makers. Susan says climate policy, innovation and promoting court battles and Juan says climate education first and then promoting solutions. Sri Durga, wow, says, yeah, Sri Durga says she thinks energy policy is important, especially stopping subsidization of fossil fuels. And Elise is promoting education as at the root of most of these solutions. Anyone, anyone else wanna unmute themselves and speak? This is uh, David Van Cedars here from the West Coast. Um, uh, what I would um, offer is, I think a huge amount of the challenges we're facing are related to the design of our systems, the design of our governance systems, the design of our economic system, the design of our education systems that allows certain education departments to promote a view of economic growth, for example, and others that are completely against it and allow those to coexist without having there being vigorous to debate to, to solve that. Mm -hmm. um, and of those, I, I really feel that the um, changing the economic system and having a discussion about why we uh, want to why we have our certain economic goals and why it's designed the way mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really like your list. I think it's really helpful. And, uh, but that one's so important, I feel that it should be called, called out. And okay, but then but how do you do that? How do you change the economic system? What strategies, what concrete strategies can do that? Policy, so, yeah. demonstrating? What? So um, in this particular case, it's about looking at what are the root causes of our sustainability challenges or our lack of progress on climate change and to identify where those are, which really have to do with our blind spots. So using the same kind of logic that we use to deal with race equality and gender equality, um, recognizing that people have blind spots and then getting them to confront that because I think a huge amount of the lack of progress is that we are not even aware of our sustainability blind spots. Mm, good one. And I don't know how you make people see their blind spots. So I guess that's a bit of education that could be, uh, I guess you can do that through policy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us on. Unless, are there other hands before I move us on to 
Do I see Tom Kingsbury with a hand up? If so, you could unmute yourself, Tom. There we go. No, I think the um, education is is very, very important. Uh, certainly, I mean, I'm 75, but uh, we learned a tiny bit now, but I'm not so sure that they've, uh, there's enough uh, climate education. I'm not in the uh, uh, education uh, period itself. I didn't work in that, but I've always had a great interest in uh, how we try to improve the uh, younger people coming up and, and showing them uh, ways and, you know, sort of roads to follow. I don't know how to do it really, but I yeah. need to do that. It's, it's very important. I mean, those of us sitting here are, probably have a great, great interest, but others may not even know where uh, uh, the Arboretum is, put it that way. Okay. All right. Okay, Grant, is there any more in the chat that we should hear about or shall I move on? Uh, there's actually quite a list in the chat, but um, okay. I'll invite people to read that. You should all be able to see the comments there in the chat. Great, all yeah. right. So I really advocate for being really explicit and really thinking, like really interrogating our assumptions about how change happens. Because if we're gonna do that unprecedented, far-reaching change in everything, we're going to need to think of, you know, explicitly about, okay, what is, what is, how you do that. So I've been engaging a lot with this tool called Theory of Change that helps us interrogate our assumptions about how change happens. So this is a funny little cartoon that, um, yeah, that depicts that uh, interrogation of assumptions. And a theory of change in general is our best thinking about how we'll make change in the world and why we think it will work. So it's really that why piece. And there are a bunch of tools out there that can help. Uh, a lot of activist groups use them. Uh, NGOs that are trying to make change in the world also use these um, theory of change tools to, to, to do that work. Um, so a theory of change anatomy, and it's basic, there's some very complicated ways to, 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 to do this work, but the simplest one I found is this one. It's like if, then, because. So it's a um, if X, then Y, because Z or Z. <laughs> so, and it's by saying be, the because Z, that's where your assumption is. And that's where you can be like, okay, actually, is that true? So here are some examples. If we tell everyone that climate change is real, then we can stop climate change because knowledge leads to action. Okay, but does it? What is the empirical evidence for that? When does that happen? When does that not happen? Is all knowledge lead to action? Does it lead to action for everybody? You could really start to pick that apart, but we need to be able to really, ask ourselves why we think um, education is the, is the solution. And then this more silly <laughs> example of a theory of change, if I am persistent and disruptive, then she will fall in love with me because it is romantic and charming and not creepy. So the assumption there is that being persistent and disruptive is romantic, charming and not creepy, which is clearly not true. <laughs> and so, but by being explicit about it, by having to force yourself to say well, the because, you can really, uh, pick that apart and 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 often this is done collectively uh, in groups is this actually how change happens uh let's let's dig into it let's let's do the research let's find the empirical evidence let's think through the logical steps is that how it happens in what context does it what context is it not so that's the very basic the easiest approach to uh, thinking about your theory of change but it's going to get i'm going to show you some more complex models as we go so in my early conversations with, with uh, climate activists and organizers across Canada, I just had some preliminary conversations where I said, so how do you think transformative change happens? And these are just some of the, um, just like really tiny snippets of the giant conversations I had. Uh, for example, if you get public on side, the politicians will follow. Is that true? And you notice that there's a, beca the, the because is missing there. So why, why will the politicians follow? Why can we assume that's true? If we want change to happen, we need industry buy-in. Is that true? <laughs> Again, because it's missing. Without big protests and confrontation and direct action, it's hard to imagine how Canada will be woken up to deal with these problems. So a lot of people put a lot of um, faith in big protest and confrontation. Other people don't. Why? <laughs> um, 
it's all around education. Once we know, we can't unknow and are compelled to act. So that's one of the most common assumptions about how change happens. And I'm not saying that's not how it happens. I'm saying, let's figure out exactly how that happens, you know, because not because there's been climate education for decades and we're still losing the battle. So is maybe education is important, but is it sufficient on its own? These are the kinds of these are the kind of questions we need to be asking ourselves. And another reason I've been really digging into this stuff and really interested in it is that I've noticed that people have very strong opinions about how change happens, even when their opinions are pretty based in assumptions and aren't really, um, they're, they're almost unspoken assumptions, but we hold them very strongly. And I, I, do, th I do that too. So like this cartoon that came out in a Canadian newspaper last year when there was a giant youth climate mobilizing. And in this comic, you could see this like conflicting theories of change where these young students are on the street marching, but this other guy is like, no, 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 that's not how change happens voting that's how change happens you young folk so which one of them are right but i use this uh to show that this prevalence of conflicting but un, un uninterrogated assumptions about how change happens and as i got to dig more and more into this stuff um in my research i, be, I began to notice that there's a lot of a lot of sort of a lot of the tensions uh, amongst people, be them in academic circles or in activist circles, um, is over these unspoken assumptions about how change happens that we hold strong. And there's oh, there's um, several of these sort of uh, conflicting notions. One between does, does change happen through confrontation or compromise, right? People have strong feelings about that. Does it happen by pushing, from working inside the system or by pushing from outside the system? Does changing to come from the top down through legislation, through policy, or from bottom up through, through mobilizing on the street, for example? And does, does change need to be radical? Do we need to change everything now, or do we need to do slow incremental steps towards change more reformist? And then should we focus on resisting what we don't want or focus on building the solutions? And finally, uh, another big one is, does change happen through collective action or from individual life change? So a lot of the debates that go on in our various academic and activist circles, sort of pivot on these various um, things. And I'm, I've been arguing that change is a lot more complex. The systems we're trying to change are much more complex and change itself as a process is more complex than any of these like easy dualisms. And so we need to have more explicit and more complexified nuanced understandings of change so that we can affect change more effectively, <laughs> right? Yeah, so this pretending it's one way or the other is not helping us. We need more nuanced, um, more complex theories of change. So when I, in my PhD, I read a lot. I did a, a giant literature review, which it ended up being 100 pages that I had to narrow down to 30 pages in my thesis, but uh, a literature review on academic theories of change. And I had like many, 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 many dozens of conversations with people where I asked them about their theories of change. And from that, I have been developing uh, <laughs> uh, theories of change that I, I'm starting to, to feel confident about. But yeah, I just wanna make clear again that the theories of change that I'm gonna present, be presenting are really grounded in movements, in social movements, uh, indigenous movements, climate justice movements, the anti-pipeline movement. I've been working closely with people. And so again, a lot of the stuff I'm saying comes from the ground and um, lived experience with pushing for change every day. Um, and all the stuff I'm gonna be talking about is in the book. Have I mentioned the book? But it's also, um, <laughs> I also wanted to make sure that this, um, the learnings, the lessons that I uh, generated in all these conversations that they're accessible to everyone, not just people who have the time to read the giant thesis or the money to buy the book. So I also created this um, a summary report for activists and land offenders. It's a 30 page PDF, you can, it's free. It's quick to read and it summarizes all the, so it, it takes the 300 page thesis and put it in 30 pages of a uh, uh, summary. So um, I just wanted to share that again in case anyone wants to know more about any of the stuff I'm going to be saying. So as I started to read early on in the process, so let's say back in 2015 or something, I started to come across these 
these theories of change that started to bring in that there's different things that need to happen, different dimensions of change. And one of the first ones I found was Joanna Macy's Three Dimensions of the Great Turning. Joanna Macy is a systems theorist. She's an eco-feminist Buddhist. She's great. And she, she, her, she emphasizes that it, you need to do the resistance. You need to stop the destruction. You need to slow down the, the damage that's being done. But you also need to be simultaneously creating and promoting the alternatives. But even that, not, neither of those are sufficient on their own, or even two, the, two of them together are not sufficient on their own. You also need to be changing the story, the worldviews, the values that under, undergird, that support uh, the, the ongoing destruction and can support a much more uh, just and sustainable um, economic system or whatever it is. So she has this three-part model. And then I came across this one, which I really, really liked, which is Ethan Miller. He's a, he's a scholar of uh, solidarity economy. So he really talks about uh, alternatives to capitalism. And he says that a transformative movement needs to be doing the defense. So protecting life, land, community, dignity, and also creating new ways of living together, new ways of social organization, new economic and political systems. But that also we need to be healing, healing our social fabric, healing ourselves from the trauma of living during this time. But those things are not enough. We actually need to be actively dismantling the systems that are act, uh, that are not working. So actively dismantling the systems, institutions, and practices. So there we got this. So now there's a four-part four part model, the four wings of a transformative movement. Then there's Meadows, uh, Donella Meadows' leverage points. So she's also a systems thinker. And this also um, nuances change in that she talks about there are different levers of change. Um, this might, might be familiar to some of you here, um, where some, some levers of change are easy to pull. Let's say like policies that change change uh, flows of, 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 of resources in the country. Those are important and they're easier to pull, but they don't make huge change. Whereas other ones like changing people's worldviews or changing the goals of a system, like the goals of capitalism is economic growth. If you could change that, that would change everything. That's very hard to change, but if you can change it, it has huge wide, like wide sweeping impacts. So different places in the system to intervene and the implications of those. So this, again, it's complexifying our understandings of change. This is, I'm not gonna go through them all, but there's, <laughs> from my literature review, I summarized it into um, eight key lessons about how change happens. And this is all from, yeah, the huge reading on, on theories of uh, academic theories of change. But one that I wanna pull out is that there are many kinds of change, right? Like saying like um, a, a policy changing, that's a, that's a form of change. A community um, moving from being dependent on, on fossil fuels to being dependent on hydro or renewable energy, uh, other kinds of renewable energy, that that's a different kind of change. And yet a different kind of change is when we move away from an economic system that was disastrous to one that actually functions for people on the planet. So those are very different kinds of change. So you need to know which kind of change you're trying to bring about. And then, because that has different implications on who the key actor should be, who your target should be, what your strategy should be, who you should be working with. So it's very important to know what kind of change. And I would like to advocate <laughs> for um, a specific kind of change called transformative change. And there's more and more scholarship. There's there's a lot of people doing this work um, around the world, different scholars of social transformation. Um, Leah Temper, who is a research associate at the, in NRS through the economics for the, or through leadership for the Ecozoic Project. She does work explicitly on transformation. So do I, so do many others. And right now I'm also actually on the steering committee of Concordia's new shift center for social transformation. And this is their working definition of social change, or so, sorry, social transformation. So it's an intentional process of systemic change to address not only the symptoms, but the root causes of inequity, injustice, and unsustainability. So that someone brought that up early, sorry, I forget your name, sir, but you mentioned this need to target the root causes. So that is what transformation, transformative change is changing things from the root, from the root causes. And transformative change brings about change at the level of a whole system impacting social norms, belief, resource production and consumption patterns, rules, practices, technologies, infrastructures, and this is very important, the distrib distribution of power in society. So that's the kind of change I've been thinking about because that's the kind of change that I think could do that 
that wide sweeping unprecedented change that the IPCC is calling for. So we need to be explicit about that in the work we're doing. And when we're talking about how does change happen, how does transformative change happen? And so there's this model called the equality that uh, different climate activists use to identify, to try to identify where they should be targeting their, their work. And so they use this tree model of seeing the symptoms as sort of the branches and the leaves. So let's say a symptom is carbon pollution in the air heating up the planet. Well, what are the institutions that are allowing for that ongoing flow of greenhouse gases? Well, let's say the banks, let's say the government, let's say um, whatnot. But then, okay, so you have these institutions that are facilitating the ongoing problems that are leading to the symptoms, but what are the root causes that are propping up, that are justifying, that are holding these institutions in place? There you have things like capitalism, you have colonialism, you have worldviews based on hierarchy that sees, you know, so the, these are where you can start to dig out uh, what are, what is holding the status quo in place and hindering the transformation from happening that we're all working for. So this is a model that's useful. And this is now directly coming out of the conversations. And this is a images from that um, summary report that I showed you earlier. So when I asked people that I talked to, how do you envision the future? Like what is the kind of change you're trying to bring about in the world? People talked about, yes, we need to decarbonize. We need to move the economy away from, um, from fossil fuels, from ongoing endless they need to endlessly grow, et cetera, but that's not enough. You actually need to be decentralizing power and the way decisions are made. And you need much more democratic control of energy systems or economic systems, these kind of things. But even that's not enough. You actually need to be decolonizing. So fundamentally um, reorganizing the social relations whereby no one is being pushed off their lands. No one is, uh, uh, being dominant or oppressing other people. So really this is deep, deep, deep change. This is the kind of change we're talking about when I present this model. So this is what I've been living to. So <clears throat> I talked to almost a hundred people. I asked them how, they're, how they understand change. What is their theory of change? And then I took all their answers and some of their answers were really complex and I put them all together into this one model. So as if everyone's answer was contributing a, a piece of piece, piece to the puzzle. And this now is the, the puzzle I put together. So in a broad sweep, um, we have that change happens through how we, um, how we, how, let me start with the context. And this is really important. It's, uh, it's not just what we're doing, but the context in which we're acting. And a lot of people talked about that timing really matters. What, what can change in one, uh, one point in time, um, or what's possible change-wise in one point in time is not possible at a different time or in a different location that the context really matters that sometimes events happen, crises happen that change what's possible. And we're seeing that right now with COVID, this whole focus on build back better, this opening of the status quo, this disruption that is allowing uh, real reflection on, on, on where our societies should be going and what should we should be prioritizing. So this is how crisis and timing and events create this context in which we act. And that it really matters how we understand and what we value. So this is the worldviews, the value systems, how we understand the systems that um, are the that, that we live in, how they're driving the problem, how how they can be different. Um, this is really about changing the story, the narrative, this kind of thing. And it, part of that, uh, a lot of the people I talked to really emphasized that if you want to understand the system and you want new narratives, this world work has to be really done through amplifying the voices of those most impacted, the people who are most impacted by the climate crisis, by the inequality crises. And in Canada, that really uh, largely is racialized communities and especially indigenous communities. So that this uh, transformative change needs to be deeply informed and led by indigenous folks. And so, but of course it's not, it's not just how we understand and what we value. It's important how we take action in the world. So people talked a lot about um, taking action through building power, through collective action, coming together, mobilizing, organizing, uh, strategizing, and you sort of build power together. Um, but what, what it was less agreed on is where you then direct that power, you're, that sort of political power you're building up through collective action. Some people really 
felt like you, that the point of doing that is to influence decision makers, policy legislation, and change happens through that. People, other people really feel like that'll never work because of the um, sort of um, vested interests of those in power to, to maintain the status quo. So therefore we need to be focusing that people power on confronting and dismantling power. But that was like the, the bit of part of the, the model where there's ongoing tensions, but there's interesting ways and you can read about in the book to resolve those tensions or to work, sort of work in uh, good cop, bad cop kind of um, <laughs> uh, coordinations. Um, but all through this, there's a, a, a shared sense that folks uh, shared with me um, that came up again and again in the conversations that how we relate really matters. So you need people doing all these kinds of things, working from the inside, working from the outside, the top down, the bottom up, through conflict, through co cooperation, um, through collective action, through individual lifestyle choice. You need all that to be happening, but it has to, needs to be done way more coordinated. Right now, there's a lot of different people doing different things in really um, fragmented, siloed ways. So we need to be coordinating more. We need to be uh, building better relations, uh, relationships of solidarity across different movements. So movement for black lives and uh, climate movements and feminist movements and environmental movements. How do we, how do we start weaving those that power together so we can be pushing for a more just and sustainable world together, like amplifying that power together. And in order to build those relations, we need to be unlearning uh, our sort of worldviews of domination whereby, because uh, there's this um, shared sense that we're carrying racism, sexism, um, colonial mindsets into our work in, in social movements, in uh, social change work. And that's hindering those relations of solidarity that would allow us to build this like real uh, powerful transformative force through movement of movements. So yeah, this is where, this is the model of, of social change that that came out of uh, my my research. I'd love to hear what you have to think about it. And I'd also like, love to hear what this, what you think of this model and whether you think it sheds light on your own uh, approach to change. You see your own approach in there. Are you focused on education? Are you focused on electoral systems? So where, where does your work fit into this? and Maybe who do you have to work with in order to, to work more effectively in this sort of ecosystem of change efforts? So I'd like to put it back out to you all in terms of, yeah, reflecting on this, where do you see your work fitting into this model? And again, feel free to unmute yourself, speak, put your hand up or share in the chat box. Susan, do you have a question or a, a, a comment to a make? Comment. I have. I can't see myself, but um, I'd like um, to make a comment. I've been working on various peace uh, environmental issues for 45 years, maybe. And um, I used to be very confrontational or, or uh, protester, etc. cetera. Um, I still am very strong, but I found that I'm more effective when I connect more with the person that I'm trying to reach, either my MP, my mayor, <clears throat> or, um, if I can connect with them first and get to know them as a person, then I'm much more effective and I'm getting more success on various issues that I'm working on. Networking is important. Uh, one thing that we're working on now is trying to save the woods to the west of Fairview. And sometimes it's lack of, um, expertise um, for that. Like I, I need more people who are help, are able to identify plants, animals, etc. cetera. Um, so sometimes you, you're you quite right in saying that we need to reach out to all the different, it's not just what we know, but what we have to reach to everybody so that we can um, streamline our effects and be more effective. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Yeah, I feel like that you're really echoing what I heard a lot was that relationships really matter within the yeah. movements, in relationships with the people you're trying to influence, that like actual real human connection really matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who yeah. else has some reflections on where their work fits into this model or? Yeah. Here we have somebody wondering if there are models that consider any infighting or conflict within the groups. That are working toward change. 
Yeah, I'm about to share that with you. <laughs> I'll okay. share a bit about that in, in a minute on the next slide. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. But I, I do feel like this how we relate piece, this uh, it goes around this uh, corner here, the how we relate, which weaves through everything else, includes that, encompasses this ability to to get along enough, <laughs> to work together enough to build collective power to influence things. So yeah, for sure that's implied in this for sure. And Tim is wondering, he has quite a long piece in the chat here and I'll share this with you afterwards, uh, Jen, I'll save the chat for you. Please he's wondering if there is an underlying assumption that change happens primarily because of human agency or is it often something outside of our control? Well, that's where the context piece comes in, right? So there's uh, tons of forces all the time, human and non-human, uh, including forces coming from other humans that are working for a social change in all kinds of different directions, uh, other than towards, you know, <laughs> a livable planet and just, uh, just social relations. So there's tons of things going all the time, uh, going on all the time, including ecological factors, um, biophysical things that are going on that are, that, that create the context, the conditions in which we're uh, taking action. And this model is trying to emphasize that you need to be really mindful and attentive to the conditions as they change and um, developing your strategies based on that. Uh, generally, there was a lot of reflecting going on in, in the conversations I had where, where we tend to ignore the conditions and think what would work last year is going to work now, even though maybe the world's completely changed with COVID. So what, what is possible now? So COVID is a non-human <laughs> condition factor right now that is really um, changing what's what's possible, what kind of change is possible. Um, and actually my current um, research, one of, I have two research projects going on for my postdoc. And one of them is talking to um, organizers across Montreal, community organizers, and asking them to think with me about how COVID has, is creating a, uh, can be seized as an opportunity for transformative change in the Montreal economic and social and political systems. So uh, that's explicitly trying to take this non-human <laughs> factor as, a, as very seriously in terms of understanding the context. Okay, so you asked me to give you the signal, Jen. We've got about 17 minutes left before the top of the hour. Great, thanks. Um, maybe if there's one more person who wants to reflect on where they see themselves or their own work in this uh, model, I'd love to hear it. And then I'll wrap it up. Hearing, hearing none, I will, oh, sorry, just gotta find my, oh, there it is. I've lost my mouse. Okay, let's just see if I could, yeah, okay. So I didn't just ask people, how do you think change happened? Ha happens, I asked them a lot of other questions, including what are the most significant barriers to the change you're trying to create in the world? And this is the bar chart that shows you the kind of frequency of the kinds of answers I got. And this also, it's really important, just like being attentive to context, also being attentive to what are the main barriers standing in your way? What are the main forces pushing against you? And as you see here, um, the largest kind of answer was around the economic system, which we've named a couple of times tonight, uh, economic system def um, sort of de defined by capitalism right now is the biggest barrier to uh, addressing climate, uh, climate change. So that, that needs to deeply inform our strategies and how we go forward. How do you, how do you create strategies that actually um, confront and transform the economic system? But of course, lack of public will is also a very common kind of answer to the barriers. As was the corporate influence on the, the political system, uh, the way um, corporations are benefiting from the uh, um, the status quo are, 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 are using their power and their influence to try to keep the system from transforming away from fossil fuels and towards something more sustainable. So we need, like, how do you, how do you wage social change efforts, whether you're doing education or whether you're doing protesting or whether you're doing policy work, how do you do that knowing that these are the main barriers staying in your way and how do you be strategic about it? But these are just the kind of answers I got. So I got two different kinds of answers. I got answers to that question that were about the um, barriers that are external to the movements that I'm part of. But then people also gave me answers that were about um, more internal barriers to change, the barriers that exist in our, in our movements or in our change, social change efforts. And the biggest one 
by far. And this is this bar in real life is twice as big as the capitalism bar <laughs> in terms of number of mentions is relational tensions that the difficulty in actually getting along. <laughs> and so this 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 goes uh, the explanation of this bar goes on for about 40 pages in the book <laughs> and longer in the thesis. Uh, poor Peter Brown had to read it, <laughs> uh, the long version, but um, to summarize, there's many sources of tensions, including these tensions over unspoken uh, but conflicting theories of change, conflicting end goals. So there's people in these movements, some who are just, their end goal is to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, whereas other people, their, their end goal is to try to um, return land to Indigenous people, to have land returned to Indigenous people that was stolen from them at the point of European colonization of these lands. So those are very, very different uh, end goals, but those are people who are still working together daily <laughs> in the climate movement, right? So that's, um, but there's other kinds of relational tensions, but I just wanted to name that in response to that question we just had about what about the difficulty, but I don't think this is just in social movements. I think we'll find this in, in our departments at the universities, in all kinds of settings, humans right now are not, <laughs> we're not great at getting along, especially getting along with people who have different views, politically different views, as we're seeing all kinds of polarization all over the place politically these days, it seems to be mounting. And I think it's mounting in the times of COVID because as most of our rela uh, relating is happening online where people could be more dismissive and less understanding and bring their heart less to the conversation, I think there's even more polarization. So these relational tensions are alive in the movements, but exist elsewhere. And so this idea, again, bring it back to our model of change that how we relate is deeply important to the ability to transform our systems. So really being attentive to our relations in all we do is really important. As you can see, there's other internalized internal barriers. You could look at the report of the book if you wanna learn more about those. And lastly, I just want to, um, I just want to, yeah, I just want to tell you about this the, again about the the report and where you can find it. So I can add these links, or if someone else can, I, I can do it after when we start chatting. Um, these where you can get the the links for the French and English version online, it's free, and the book is actually a promo code uh, that the publisher just gave me today for this and another event I'm doing tomorrow, where anyone who wants to buy this work, the book this week before the 25th gets 20 percent off and you just need that code. So perhaps I will cut and paste that as well into the chat. And so that's, um, that's what I wanted to share. I thank you for listening, for, um, for your patience with my endless use of the word change and transformation. <laughs> and uh, I'd love to hear more about what you all think about it all and see what, what Grant wants to do with the rest of our time together. Thank you, Jen. I was just reposting the link to the web page for your book, and I put the Thanks. promo code above it there. So if anybody's Thank interested, you can use that. Thank you. So thanks again, Jen, for, for the great talk. We've got quite a lot of questions, um, some in the chat that people have asked. Um, and I, I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of them. Um, but also, if you see a lull in the conversation and you would like to make a verbal comment or question, then please unmute yourself and, and offer your question up for Jen. Uh, one question from Sheila in the chat. She asks if the stages of change come into each of these pieces of the puzzle, for instance, pre-contemplation, contemplation, et cetera. Great one. So I don't know if you remember that slide that had the eight like lessons, uh, key lessons from the literature review on the theories of change, one of the key lessons was there are many stages of a transformative, of a transformative change. Uh, and so there's, um, yeah, that, that was something that, I, I, that I, I wrote a bunch about and that came up. So different stages of like, usually uh, social transformative change starts with disruption, <laughs> a dis dis disruption, whether that's created by social movements or uh, humans or disruption created by something like COVID. Um, it often starts like that, but it ends like with more institutionalization as things become routinized. And so different actors are implicated in those different stages where disrupt disruptive change, you're gonna have your more confrontational activists. And at the end, maybe you're gonna have your policymakers or your, 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 you know, doing that kind of routinization or institutionalization phase. So yeah, thinking about where you are at <laughs> in any particular transformative process is super important. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, David, our friend from the West Coast mentions 
that he believes a meta strategy that we need for to reduce relational tension is to acknowledge that both parties might want positive change, but they just disagree on how to achieve it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, yeah, the thing I was seeing over and over and over again in the movements I'm part of was, and also the academic communities that I'm part of is this like, these endless uh, debates over, over things, but what's really going on under the debate is that's not how I see change happening. Um, so I, I think you're right that people, we generally agree that we want a livable planet and like people to be kind to each other and everyone to have a, access to a decent life. But then how we get there, it's true. That's, I think that is where um, most of the tension lies. And I'm not sure why <laughs> we have so much trouble um, uh, having different views on that. But I think if we can have this meta, meta theory of change where we understand that it actually takes a lot of people doing a lot of very different things, then we could develop more tolerance for people doing change in other ways. Like people focus on education could respect the fact that other people are focusing on, on the more disruptive stuff or they're getting, you know, being on the streets and demonstrating public will or, you know, this kind of things. Like I agree that it would really help if we had more understanding of the giant complexities of change, what's required and therefore uh, people doing it in very different ways. But that said, I think there are ways that our, the work going on could be actually in conflict where we're actually making each other's job harder. <laughs> so um, there's, I, I've read about that in the book too. So how do you think about this bigger sort of system of change where people are doing really diverse things, but make sure that everyone's doing it in a way that we're all pushing in the same direction and not against each other. Cause that is actually also happening. So being able to identify when that's happening and figure out how to push in a common direction. Very good. Um, if you have other questions you'd like to write in the chat, please do so. But if anybody has a question they would like to ask verbally, you can unmute yourself now and ask Jen directly. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Sridhar. Uh, well, I'm about to graduate in December and, and I'm, I'm graduating in bioresource engineering. And I have no idea what I want to do after and like what would be the most effective way to not affect change with my degree. So I don't know if you have any advice or anyone in the group has any advice. So I think there's as many ways of affecting change as there are people. Like we all have different skills, know-how. We also have different things that we can <laughs> we we can enjoy doing or tolerate doing some people like I, I hate I hate debating I hate fighting and so I've some in sometimes I'm in situations where I'm out of my realm because I don't want to fight uh, so that's but other people love fighting so then they <laughs> they should be the ones at the debates or you know you know uh, lobbying the government for whatever I just don't want to do that so I would say thinking about what kind of change you want to affect like in the long term and then thinking about what are many different useful ways to get there and then what are you best suited for what are you most what do you most uh, enjoy what can you stand what can you tolerate and um yeah because it's whatever it is it's got to be something you can do in the long term because this is not a short fight so doing something that you're yeah anyway yeah thank you yeah so in the chat, um, David asks, how helpful do you think it is to convene multi-stakeholder dialogues to identify root causes of sustainability challenges? I can't get enough of that stuff. I love, yeah. Like I, I think, and that's why I, I approached my research as I did instead of like developing my own theory of change, like all out of my own head or something. Cause I don't think that would be, I don't think my brain is big enough <laughs> to understand the complexity of change. But I think like, a hundred of us with different life experiences and different perspectives, creating a model together, uh, that's when you start to grasp, <laughs> grasp the complexities necessary. So I, I really think any opportunity to think together across differences is gonna really help our theorizing and our practice. So yeah, convening conversations. And I think the harder they are, the more fruitful they are, like talking to people you don't necessarily agree with. Uh, it's harder, but I think it's more fruitful. So I think that, yeah, that's what it's gonna, yeah. Again, that ties it back to that theory, uh, the relationship uh, aspect of the theory of change, how we relate really is really important because we need to get along 
enough to sit in the same room together to really hash out these these strategies together that benefit from all our experiences, all our best thinking. And sometimes you can't do that because we <laughs> it's too hard to collaborate, right? So yeah, I'll leave it at that. And would anyone else like to unmute themselves and ask a question? Now is your chance. I have a question if no one else does. Go for so, it. Yeah, this is, um, so in, in, in the climate activism I'm doing, there's a lot of um, young folks these days. It's a very youthful group. A lot of people in their early 20s, late teens. Um, and then in, in the university, there's a lot of young folks too. And this is a more age diverse group than I've been in a while. So there's people who have a longer view of history than I have in my 40 some years and then the climate activists. So I'd love to take this opportunity to hear about, so some of you have seen, you know, 60 or 70 uh, or 80 years of change and a lot has changed. I think the world has never changed. So, so there's perspectives you have on what are the moments where things have really changed and why. I would love to hear some of that if we have a moment. Not gonna give up. <laughs> yeah, great, Catherine. Catherine has her hand up. You can unmute yourself, Catherine. Oh, okay. So funny enough, my husband and I were talking about this earlier today, in that <clears throat> historically there's been a lot of things that have happened that came about um, from social pressure. So like now smoking is taboo. Mm. Before it was very acceptable. Um, bicycle helmets. I mean, we first started wearing bicycle helmets 35 years ago, it was, um, you were a nerd. Now it's, you're a nerd if you don't wear a bicycle helmet. So we were, we were just discussing what, what causes this pressure socially to make this change. Um, Seatbelts was another one. It became a law, but it was more uh, social action at first. And ski helmets is another one. Mm -hmm. A lot of safety. <laughs> yeah. and, and now masks. <laughs> yeah, masks, yeah. exactly. Well, that's very interesting because at first when COVID happened, people felt really odd wearing a mask. It was hard. Now it's like, why aren't you wearing a mask? So in a very short period of time, we socially adjusted to that. Um, I mean, it is mandatory if you're going in somewhere, but I'm talking about like even outside. So that's, mm -hmm. that's another interesting one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I like looking at, I personally, in terms of climate change, is very much um, like I was at the protests, at uh, the Friday po protests, and I use Facebook kind of like a blog. Um, I've been vegetarian for 12 years. Um, so I'm very much live my life and show others by education. Um, but I also really think culturally we need to have a switch. It, I mean, you can do a lot obviously with uh, laws, but I think a faster route is culture. And the other one that really came, comes to mind is Chevron has, as a corporation has made a change. So they went from uh, Shell, I think, too, maybe. They've gone from distinguishing themselves as a petroleum company to an energy company. So they see the switch. They're, they're trying to make the switch. And with climate change, I think we need to get these big corporations in the room. Like, um, I forget the woman who mentioned, um, uh, uh, Susan, I think it was, about... Uh, not being confrontational, bring them in and say, okay, you have a company, it's a dying company, here's the writing on the wall, you can fight, 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 but in the end, there's only so much oil in the world. And if we make it socially not acceptable that we're using all this oil or eating all this meat, creating methane gas, then they've got to change or they're gonna be, they're gonna be gone. Well said. Very good. We have time for another couple of questions. And then what I'll do is I'll end the recording 
but I'll leave the session open in case people want to stick around and have a discussion. So does anybody have a question they want to have on the record? Uh, I would ask something if I can. This is Sheila. Sure. Hi, Jen. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for all the info. Hi, everybody. Um, so given all of your work, all of your knowledge, all of the transformative insights that you've got, what would you say would be a starting point for the average person? So somebody who's not doing the... Uh, PhDs, who's not studying at Mac, who's not at McGill in the school environment, the average person who's just trying to feed their family, get their work done. So what have you seen that would be a great place for them to start, aside from reading your book and the PDF, which is awesome? <laughs> uh, that's a, that is the, the question. <laughs> that is a great question. Because I think there are a lot of people who, who want to contribute to building a better world and want to do that now. And I, like I was saying earlier, like there really is a uh, unlimited number of ways to, to do that. So um, I would say th three things, <laughs> like don't just do one thing and then be like, it's done. Okay. I now I recycle, so I don't have to worry about it. Or I voted, you know, for the NDP or Green Party. So I don't have to, you know, whatever it is, um, think more holistically than that. But like, I would say, uh, make sure you're you're voting for people who, I mean, even though there's limited <laughs> limited uh, leadership that is is transformative, it's not a lot, but at least make sure you're you're voting in a way that supports uh, real climate action. Secondly, um, get in, get get in touch with there. There are hundreds of climate groups uh, across Canada. Um, who are different things. I, I work with Climate Justice Montreal. Get in touch and say I have one hour a week that I could uh, contribute, what can I do? And they'll be like, oh, you know what you could do? You could help send out this mailer once a week or, and seriously, like there's there's tons of need for help. So I would say get involved with a uh, climate group, offer whatever time and skills you have, uh, vote well. Um, and then just, yeah, another really important thing is, uh, is, is paying attention to what's going on on the ground in Canada. And when there is indigenous people being, uh, um, being treated with 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 violence uh, because they're defending their lands and their waters against extractive industry. Don't let that go unnoticed. Make sure the people you you talk to know that that's going on. Make sure to send letters to the, you know, your MP or whatever, saying it's not okay that right now that Mi'kmaq fisheries are getting uh, burnt down by uh, or that you know uh, settler hunters are like non-indigenous hunters are, are, are threatening the lives of indigenous hunters in Anishinaabe territory or that you know military or police are going into Unistoten territory because they want to push through a pipeline like it's really important like to be paying attention to those things because me personally I haven't promoted it or focused on it tonight but I, I put my hope with um the leadership of indigenous people who are defending their territories. They have the worldviews, they have the fierce love for their territories and they're defending it with their lives and willing to put their lives on the line, but they can't do it alone. They need the support of average Canadians, people like, like myself to actually uh, put some support behind and not let this violence continue. Uh, like how does that become socially unacceptable? When, when treating indigenous people who are defending their land with violence becomes socially unacceptable, then we're talking about transforming Canada. <clears throat> okay, sorry, I'm sorry, I hope you don't, sorry you asked. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Sheila, for your yeah. question. Thank you, Jen, for your answers. <laughs> and thank you for the great presentation this evening. It was very thought provoking. I'm sure I'm like many people during this time of pandemia and uh, sequestration, there's been a lot of introspection going on and questioning worldviews and so forth. So this was really more fuel for the fire. So I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank all of the audience for joining us tonight. It's so nice to see such a diverse group of people from so many places. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I'm going to stop the recording now and wish you a good evening. Um, if you'd like to stay online and have a little talk with your buddies, your neighbors, with Jen, you know, you're absolutely free to do that. Um, but if you choose to leave us now, I, I wish you a good evening.